This is actually a pinch me moment. No, don't really. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to my channel, I'm Simon of Savage Reads and today I am delighted to be joined by Kate Atkinson. People who followed my blog and um, my blog and, and everything for a while will know that my gran was a huge, huge, huge fan of yours, like insane. And it's really weird, whenever you've had a new book out since, it's weird that I can't talk to her about it. It's a really, really weird thing. Yeah. But my mum is also a fan and I can't talk to her about it. But we're going to talk a bit about Transcription, which is your new novel which is all about a woman called Juliet, a very young woman, but it actually starts when she's older. A I very forget dramatic I wrote, I, moment. I always forget I wrote that chapter because I wrote it last. And I'll say, <laughs> it's in two time periods, 1940 and 1950, and then someone will go, and 1981, I'm going, oh yeah, of course. And then we go back to 1950 when she's 28, and then about half of the book is in 1950, and about maybe slightly more than half actually is in 1940 when she's just 18. And when and she recently gets, orphaned. And also when she gets drawn into a life of being a spy. Yes. Which isn't as exciting as she thinks. It is exciting, the book's exciting, but her vision of what it might be to be a spy and then be a typist. Yes. Isn't so she's, quite... Her weapon is the typewriter. <laughs> and, is, and it is very tedious. Well, all typing is tedious um, on the whole, especially when you're in one of those old big heavy machines that are built like tanks. What's really fascinating is she's a really interesting character because, and I think this is something that you do in pretty much all your fiction, you, you characters are always complex, always a bit flawed, they've always got mm. lots of sides to them. But she's particularly, she loves lying. She is a pathological liar. I don't think I realised, I suppose I, I realised she was a liar as soon as I started writing, but then I thought, well, liars are not necessarily attractive. Uh, no. in real life and not necessarily attractive in characters so I had to make sure I kept her being um, someone that we could cleave to as a character whilst at the same time she has. but her lies a lot of her lies are entirely innocent they're just like saying oh you know these trousers are white and because it's it's this automatic thing where she just and what she doesn't realize when she has this interview initially with MI5 it's one of those things when you know you go well, I really don't want this job, so I'm going to give a really rubbish interview. And of course, the more she lies in this interview, the more she's so offhand, the more they realise that this is exactly the kind of girl that they want. So she's sort of, you know. But she's also quite unreliable, which I like, even though you're seeing it from her perspective. Because she's not a narrator, so she's not an unreliable narrator. No. And we are inside her head a lot of the time, yeah. which you would think would make it truthful. It's just that it's more a sin of omission than a sin of commission on my part, I suppose. Because <laughs> I like to write books, well I like to read books that have a secret in mm. the heart of them that's embedded that you only find out really at the end, those to me are the best books and so the secret that is carried with Juliet through the book you couldn't reveal, she doesn't not tell you no, Actually, she doesn't it's me that doesn't tell you well also I think it's quite ambiguous am I allowed to say that, and we won't give any spoilers away I promise, but it is quite an ambiguous but I loved it for that I was trying to write, consciously write about in ambiguity and ambivalence, all the ambies. Um, and there's a character called Mrs. Ambrose as well, who's extremely ambivalent. And that's a very fine line to tread because um, you can really annoy your reader. I probably put myself in the position of the reader more than I usually do, so that I could think, how would I feel if I was reading this? Would this be annoying me at this point because I don't know what's oh, wow. happening? Just to make sure that you. You're mysterious enough, but not so mysterious that people are like, oh, yeah. <laughs> at this for Game of Soldiers, I'm not reading any more of this. It was funny, because I was in, a, a, the fog is, is one of the metaphors of the book, and, and I always determinedly say that if I haven't written it, I don't know what happens. So there's no Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet living happily ever after in my books. It just doesn't exist. Mm. And I actually kept a lot of things back from myself, so there was... I, I'd got to the end and I thought, well, I don't really know who was who. I just didn't want to pin everything down and say, oh, well, he did this and she did this. And, you know, it was just like, I wanted the atmosphere at the end of the book for everyone, including me, to think, well, what, what did they do? Mm. Who were they? Whose side were they on? Book groups are going to love that. Are they? They're going to love that. <laughs> Endless they discussion. But one of the most popular book blows of mine is, is one of the Brody books. And people are like, but what about the ending? But I think what's I so clever is that you've left it so that Because people still say to me, well, what happened to Courtney? I think that's at the end of uh, Started Early Got My Job. Mm. What happened to that child? I'm going, I don't know, I don't write it. <laughs> I have no idea where Courtney is. <laughs> <laughs> How much fun did you have at the series? Because every character 
has a secret. Now I find, and I don't want, it's a tricky one because I don't want to spoil this, but it is a storyline that I loved, which was Peregrine's storyline, because oh. he has a big secret and he's her boss. Oh. And there's this kind of, are they flirting or they're not? Now as a reader, I guessed what might be, were you intending that to happen so that you're a little bit ahead of Juliet? Well, he was based loosely. There, a lot of the characters are based loosely on real people. That were real people, the stories of the real people set me off mm. on this book. And he owes something to the ghost of Maxwell Knight. Right. And she owes something to the ghost of Joan Miller. Joan Miller has a, a very short autobiography, which I think she's trying to extract some vengeance, and <laughs> possibly, and she's not, she's not the most reliable of narrators, I don't think, but she was recruited, Maxwell Knight was head of the Countess Subversion Unit, and after the war, he worked for the BBC as Uncle Max, doing nature programmes for the children, children's children. How random. Yes. The BBC and spies are linked. Ah, they certainly are. Joan Miller had that relationship with Maxwell Knight. She lived with him. They lived together in Dolphin Square, and she ran a country house for him, and she shared a bed with him, as far as I can tell. Uh, and was utterly mystified. I was given. I was given the camera. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and she was mystified by the um, the sterility of their relationship. I think, even though you know, and also he was obviously at a time when. Well, is this is a spoiler that when we can spoil. We can, spoil, we can, can guess as a reader. When, when homosexuality was uh, well, everyone else has actually talked about this too. <laughs> so at a time when homosexuality was not something you would speak about, but it was quite useful for a spy because you're used to mm. covering up. But he would apparently drive her down Piccadilly and go, "Oh, look at those fairies! Are disgusting!" Oh. and things like that. So he obviously was very conflicted, yeah. as one might say. Yeah. And it was never. I mean, he never came out. Those days. Year, oh God! In 1940. Come on. Of course. No. I had no idea. But also, if you were that good at closeting it, you wouldn't give it away no, that easily. Away. No, because he's charming and he's. But I do love how she's like sort you. of disappointed when she goes on dates yeah. with him because yeah. nothing really happens. And, no, and, but she doesn't know any different. So no. there's a. That's... She's constantly waiting to be seduced yeah. by him. <laughs> I remember years like that. <laughs> way back, way back. You must have done so much research, and it doesn't feel like a book that's research heavy. It feels all very natural, and, and that's, I think, a real. I wonder how you go about creating that time so it's so you're aware it's that time period without it being like and then the doorbell looked like this. I know, no, it's yeah, I think because I'd done I'd done the war, as it were, in Life After Life and of God in Ruins, I thought I'm not going down that path. I'm not going down the you know, all of the slogans and the, the posters and the rationing and the the blitz spirit and all of that. I don't that's not this book. This book is only set during the war out of necessity for the story, right. because the story couldn't take place at any other time. So in a sense, and the war's not started, so it's all in the phony war period. You know, it was the enemy within that was worrying people, not the enemy without. So it's a, it's a different kind of period, and people eat well as well, people are eating well. They're not carrying their gas masks, which they should have been doing. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's really doing anything they should be doing at this time. There's not that many books. It's not like the bombing campaign, mm. because MI5, obviously, they're not writing those books because they've right. signed the Official Secrets Act. So there's very few books, really. Uh, you know, you have to sort of read around a bit and, and forage, really, for information. But a I bit felt like a spy. A bit like a spy. But I did <laughs> feel that, you know, I knew the period. I didn't, I knew, I now know, I feel, I'm probably completely wrong. I know how people spoke. I know how they wouldn't speak. I know how they behaved. I, I felt very confident not having to do any of that because I'd done it. Mm. And so I could just concentrate on this particular story. And then obviously there's a flamingo ball, but we won't say how, which is why we've got the Audubon flamingo Amazing behind us, Audubon which flamingo. never comes out very no. often. To twist his neck to fit that page. Yeah, we don't like to say what Audubon did to those birds. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I thought was interesting that you do in all your fiction, I think, is you use humour really, it's quite mm. wry, it's quite mm. dark. What is it about that that you enjoy? Because I love it as a reader. Like I'll cackle at something and then be absolutely shocked by something. <laughs> is that is it that extreme or using That's it for that way? Good, I like that reaction. I I don't consciously put humour in. People ask me this question a lot. Like, how do you how do you put humour into it? I think I don't know because I think if you put humour into something, it's unnatural. Right. So it's arising always out of the situation, and that that play of dark and light, I think, is is in all of my novels, but I can't write without it. I can start trying to write without it, and it, and it, doesn't, it doesn't work. I mean, I've just finished another book, and it's... Um, oh, you throw that one in very delicately. <laughs> I've just done another one. Just finished another one. And it's the very dark subject matter, and it's the funniest book I've ever read. <laughs> and I feel almost guilty because it's like, really, it shouldn't be this funny, but it is very black, and I think that's, that's you know, a lot of people 
want to look, maybe people who don't necessarily look at the world like that, I think can get a certain relief from reading mm. something that just says it's okay, you know, you can laugh at you can laugh, I think, but, but humour is a curious thing. Well, when, sometimes when you're grieving, that's when you laugh hysterically. Yeah. Oh, funerals, some funerals yeah. are just like a riot of people laughing. <laughs> So I've got some questions from some of my viewers. Oh, right. So, getting higgy with it, hooker with it, or even, was transcription <laughs> in your mind during Life After Life? Because there's lots of spying mentions then. No, God in Ruins was the book I was thinking about when I was writing Life After Life. Really? Because there were always going to be two books. Oh, wow. So there were, I, I, even when I first began Life After Life, I knew that Teddy had his own book. And when I was writing God in Ruins, I was thinking about transcription because that was, I always think about the book ahead. Ah, oh, okay, that's interesting. And do they kind of reflect, because actually one other question from Dojane292 was... <laughs> These are like the <laughs> Foreshadowing from uh, behind the scenes at the museum. When you wrote that, did you have these later books in mind, or is that just the way that you... Is that the stuff that interests you? No, I didn't have any of those books in mind. I didn't used to have so many books in my head. That's a good sign. That means there's loads to come. Oh, there are. I could, I've got about... Five that, wow. I could, yeah, that I could easily talk about, but that would just confuse everybody. <laughs> um, because I think, I, I do think unconsciously about those books, really unconsciously. I'm not like sitting and thinking, oh, and then that book, that's going to happen, that's going to happen. It's not like that at all. It's just because it's there and because it's got a title, and the next one's there and it's got a title. So you've got to house them already? I can't think without a title. Really? Yeah, no, no. Oh, wow. No. Gosh. Okay, so they weren't there then, but... <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the question that I got most asked, and it's probably the question you get asked all the time. Is there going to be time. another Jackson? Yes! Really? How do I know that? <laughs> yes, and indeed the book I've just finished is a Jackson. So that will be... That will be this time next year, yes. Wow. Oh, people are going to love that. I didn't know he was so popular. Oh, his appeal is, yeah. I think, male, female, whatever, you love him. Oh, I... I think he's a bit of a pain in the neck, personally. He's not your poirot, is he? <laughs> I think I feel very comfortable right in his skin, yeah. writing in him. So, so therefore, I don't particularly... To me, he's not this character. To me, he's just this... I know exactly the bit of a grumpy middle-aged man, and I know just what he's thinking. So it's a different relation. I have a different relationship with Jackson than other people do. Well, I have one that I would really love, personally. I'm just going to say this while you're mm, here. Okay. I would love Sylvia's book. I, yes, and I, I understand that, and I have thought um, about writing yes. Sylvia's book. I, just, I feel she's, every no. time she's in the book, she's got so much she's about great. her. She's great, I really like her. Um, I would like to write the Shawcrosses book, Next Door, The Next Door Neighbours. Oh. Not the girls, because they appear a lot in Life After Life, but Mrs Shawcross, I think Mrs Shawcross has an interesting story. So mm. she could, Sylvia could appear in that book. Okay. But That's just a personal request. No, no, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people say they'd like Sylvia's book. Oh. So but do you find that that's quite tricky if people really, really love an, a character? Is it quite difficult to then be like, well, actually, I don't want to go back there? It's a, well, I, I don't go that much, but then the next Jackson, which we're not talking about, um, okay. Reggie and Tatiana come back. Right. So, and Reggie is a hugely popular character, but she's all grown up now. But I think that's it's it's fun to bring characters back, and I would bring a lot more characters back if it suited what I was doing. And I would write Fox Corner every day. I mean, I would just do the Fox Corner soap, basically. <laughs> Maybe that could happen. I would love that to happen. We're putting that out there. Yeah. We would like that to happen. Because we'd all love to live in Fox Corner. Yeah, I think everybody would love to live yeah. there. Do you feel when you get to the end of the book, you know that you're done, and then you? Well, I know what. I know where no I want to see my hand there. It's like that. It's gone. <laughs> I, w I know where I want to be. I know the title. I know the beginning, and I know where I want to be at the end. It doesn't mean I necessarily know the exact lines, mm. but I know how I want to feel, how I want people to feel, how I want the book to feel. And so, as I'm working my way towards it, it becomes very clear. So the ending is the sort of payoff because it's a treat for me because I virtually I re I edit everything to you and within an inch of its life but the last page will just come clean it won't get so it's it's like this treat that i have for myself really that's lovely and then that's that's it because i've pretty much edited the whole book so there's only one kind of polishing edit to do so there's not that big thing and a final question i often get asked like because people know that I, I love your book so much what kate atkinson should i start with but i thought it'd be nice to ask what Kate Atkinson, would Kate Atkinson suggest you start with? Start with? Oh, it's, well, if you wanted to follow the development of my style, I would say start at the beginning with behind the scenes at the museum. I've still not read that because my gran yeah. 
ruined gasped, the end. Gasped, saw it. No, she, she ruined the end. She told me. Oh, no, I was like, no oh, no, sorry, no, Gran, no, wherever no, you are, yeah. told the story. It's okay. But I will once I've forgotten so, it. All. So, yeah, I think if you wanted to just, you know, work your way mm. chronologically, but if you wanted to read my best book, in my opinion, you'd read God in Ruins. Because I think that's the book I was meant to write that I wanted to write, that I was working towards. When I finished it, I just was like, well, I could stop now, or I could just accept I'll never write a book as good as this, from my point of view. That has such a, that book made me cry with one yeah. paragraph. It um, floored me. I was like, end. it was towards, it, it, yeah. I don't want to give too much away if people haven't read it yet, but it, there was a moment where you realise something, um, and, it, and it's all the possibilities, um, and that just hit me really, um, really hard. I thought all the birds. And also, I would recommend Human Croquet. I've got a real soft spot I for Human, human Croquet. croquet. So I think that was it's my just, first. It's fun as a book, but it's also... It's I mean, bonkers. I, I still haven't played Human Croquet, which is the sadness to me. Every time I see a croquet, croquet picture, I think, I want to play Human Croquet, because the rules are there. Do not touch the ball, because people are bored. But it's very Alice in Wonderland. We could indeed take the flamingos out and knock a... Well, when, when you do the Brody book next year, that'll be our next video. Okay. <laughs> we'll do some croquet <laughs> with some flamingos. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think that would be an uh, excellent idea. Well, Kate, okay, thank you so much. Oh, it's been an absolute so pleasure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll see you all in another video yeah. soon. Bye. Thank you.